James chapter number 3. Going to read the first two verses. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Now, book of James, we know, written to the church. Okay, talking to safe folk. Talking to local called out assemblies of born again believers. And he tells them, be not many masters first he says knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation now that word masters we're going to be playing a little bit of the teen's least favorite game on Sunday nights the definition game okay. masters in your bible refers to teachers it can also refer to preachers we know that many people came to Jesus and said master or they would call him rabbi which was the same word it meant the one that knew more than you did. Okay, now, James is cautioning, saying, be not many masters. Okay, in other words, be not many teachers, not many preachers, not many pastors in the same called-out assembly of Bible believers. Okay, imagine if we had 20 people that taught this Sunday school class, and we rotated. All right? God's not the author of confusion. That sounds pretty confusing. Okay, God also, through the Apostle Paul, was inspired to write that every time we assemble, it's not the will of God for everybody to get up and sing a song, for everybody that's a preacher to get up and preach, for everybody that's a teacher to get up and teach. Right? And then he goes on to say that if somebody comes in and speaks a different language than you, if he doesn't have an interpreter, have him hold his peace and speak to himself, and God will be honored and glorified in it. Why? Because God is not the author of confusion. But second, the reason he says, be not many masters, okay, it doesn't have to do with what we're really talking about today, but the Lord told me to say it. Okay, be not many masters, because those that teach, those that open up the Word of God in the house of God, and are commissioned by God to educate, to preach, to exhort, the Word's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, Everything that you can do with the Word of God, those that do it, they receive greater condemnation or a greater judgment. Okay, being completely honest with you, back I don't. It just seems like yesterday I started teaching this class. I don't know. It's been a couple of years now, brother Andy. I, I can't keep track. I'm get. I've got gray hair now. I didn't back then. I don't know if those two are related. But one of the things I really struggled with was that I knew there was a whole lot I didn't know about the Word of God. I also knew that if I got up here and I said something that wasn't in accordance with the will of God, and if you believed it, because, you know, I hope that you all think that I'm a trustworthy guy, but if you believed it just because Brother Jordan said it and you went out and did it, I'm responsible for that in the eyes of God. The fruit that comes as a result of that corrupted seed would be laid at my account. I have to give an account for every single word, every jot and tittle that I've said behind this pulpit. James is saying, yeah, it's fun every now and then to teach a class, but there's great responsibility in it. Yeah, and he's just talking about teachers here. Go and read about the responsibilities of the office of a pastor, the responsibilities of the office of a deacon. Right, those are only two offices in the church. Right, we've heard about that on Wednesday nights. Right, but those that God gives authority or gives a position, they much was given to them. They've got a place in God's hierarchy of people that God wants to use to get something done. Right, that's an honor. That's a privilege. Right, why He choose to use any of us, I don't know. But with that great blessing, with that great privilege, also comes great responsibility. And then he goes on in the next verse to say, For in many things we offend all. Or in other words, we all offend. We're all guilty of being offensive. Now don't, we'll get to the definition game here in a second, but that word doesn't mean the way that we use it nowadays. It was used in a different context back then. Okay, he's saying even teachers, 
sometimes make mistakes. Even preachers sometimes say something that it wasn't the exact right way. Right? Thankfully, we've got the Holy Ghost that can take, you know, our imperfect attempts, try as we may. I can only do so much. Right? I learned a long time ago, all I can do is say it the way that God gave it to me and trust that God will explain it to you the way that you best understand it. One of the great things about God and His gift of the Holy Ghost that indwells the believers. But He's, he's saying, we all offend. We're all guilty of that. Now what's the, the goal? Well, he mentions it here at the second. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, that means sinless, that means complete. Complete in their faith. And able to bridle the whole body. Okay, I think of Samuel the prophet. In fact, again, it just seems like yesterday I preached a message on it. But Samuel, the Bible says that God raised him up and let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, his words hit the bullseye every single time. Not because Samuel was special. God's no respecter of persons. But Samuel did his best to say what God had said unto him the exact same way that he received it. And because of his faithfulness and his diligence in trying to do what God wanted him to do, God made sure that his words hit the mark. Right? He wasn't just talking, and you know the illustration there is like archery. Right? None of them went to the left or the right and laid it out in the field. They all hit the target right where God wanted them to be. So if that's the aspiration, right, we know it's possible, because he says in verse number 2, James, for in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word. If it wasn't possible, he wouldn't present that it was an option. If it was impossible for us to not offend in word, and we're, going, we're going to be teaching on what that means, but if it were impossible, he wouldn't have even brought it up. He would have said, in many things we offend all, and we're not able to bridle the tongue. That's the next illustration he gets in verse number 3. He says, behold, we put bits in horses' mouths. Right? And with that bit, we can steer the whole horse. Then it goes on to use the illustration of a ship. Great big old seafaring vessels have very small rudders compared to the size of the rest of the ship. But yet that little thing steers and controls the whole ship. Well, back in that day it did. Nowadays they got forward rudders, mid rudders, rear rudders. Depend on something. They got jets that shoot out each side. Right, they've come a long way, but back in the day, you had one one rudder. And you could see. I mean, you can go whitewater rafting, and a little paddle about this big can steer the whole thing. Right, you go canoeing, the person in the back's job is to steer. What's he do with it? Just a paddle. Doesn't take that much effort to steer the whole canoe one way or the other. If you want your life to be miserable, let your tongue start writing checks that your body cannot cash. If you want your life to end up a mess, give your tongue free reign, is what he's saying. In fact, in verse number 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. In other words, and we find out where that fire comes from in a few verses down, he says it's set on fire from hell. Your tongue is not saved. Your flesh isn't going to heaven with you. Right? You want, I mean, he starts talking about, you know, where envyings and strife and bitterness and all these things. If you're talking like that, it's because you got a heart problem. One. But two, we all have bad days. Right? We convince ourselves we have more bad days than other people have bad days, but we all got bad days. And we have as many bad days as God wants us to have bad days. Because nothing gets to us unless it goes through His hand. But the point of the bad day is that in spite of it, we can still present ourselves perfect or complete in Christ. Not in ourselves, but in Christ. Meaning, I do what I can do. And James says if we can not offend in word, that we'd be able to bridle the whole body. 
He said, that's the trickiest thing to handle. In fact, he says in verse number 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. One comment the wrong way can hurt somebody. You plant that root of bitterness. One promise that we let fall through the cracks and forget about can discourage somebody else's faith so much that they fall out. You say, well, that can't happen. I've seen it happen. And where did it all start? Just with the tongue. And why was the tongue able to do it? Because somebody lost their control or never had control of their tongue. So let's go back to verse number 2. He says, For in many things we offend all. Well, what's that word offend mean? That word offend does not mean... I've had people talk about this verse and say, Well, we're not supposed to offend anybody. That's not what this word means. That's the way that we use the word offend nowadays. Literally, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Go look it up. Offend means to stumble, to fall, or, in certain circumstances, to infringe against, to commit against something. So what's he talking about when he says, we offend all? All of us are guilty of stumbling. And the comparison would be, those that walk upright in their Christianity. In other words, they're not slouching. Right? They're not looking at their feet and where they're walking, they're looking ahead. Right? They're not the people that slow down and start browsing around in you know, crowded areas that drive me nuts. Right? Why are you in line for food if you don't know what food you want? Get out of line, decide what food you want, and then get back in line. I don't say these things because I'm trying really hard not to offend in, in speech. Really hard. But no, that's not the offend that it's talking about. It's talking about stumbling. In other words, when your tongue becomes a hindrance to your Christianity, that's when you have offended. Then, he goes on to say, if a man offend not in word. All he's talking about, it, really... From verse number 1 all the way down to verse number 18 of this chapter. He's talking about the dangers of your tongue and how just what we say shapes so much of our lives. But yet if we can tame it in, rein it in, bridle it, and by consequence bridle the whole body. Verse number 18 we get down there. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. He says, if you can live peaceably among men because you bridled your whole body, you can sow the fruit of righteousness. But if your body isn't under your control, if you can't rein in the carnal side of you, and it runs rampant over the spiritual side of you, as a result, you can't sow righteousness because righteousness has to be sown in peace. If you're warring within yourself... How can you be at peace and go and plant peaceably? Can't do it. Why do you think Jesus said a man cannot serve two masters, love one and hate the other? Can't do something for God when everything about your life offends God. Okay, so when he says, we all offend. He includes himself in that, by the way. Everybody, no, no exception. Right, we're all guilty of it. So let's just get over that. Right? Well, they've done more. No, the Bible says you offend one part of the law, you're guilty of all the law. Right? No degree. Thankfully, it's under the blood. Thankfully, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we repent of it, He'll forgive us for it. But nobody's without exception. There was one person without exception, and his name was Jesus. And just because somebody may or may not, if you see somebody that their tongue gets in their own way and they start tripping over it, 
What's the Bible say that we ought to do? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Let's we likewise be tempted. Right? This is not an excuse to judge. This is an ex a reason for us to continually ask the Lord to judge us. Lord, show me what I'm capable of so that as a result, I trust in you more and in me less. Right? So, what do we offend? With our tongue. Where do we stumble? What are we guilty of that James is talking about? Well, I find three things. This could be a whole series, but we don't have time. Okay, first thing. We offend God's commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, this isn't just talking about the law. This is also talking about the new commandment that Christ gives it. You know, the whole law is fulfilled in this. And shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? None of us have attained to that standard. We strive for it, but we cannot, of our own volition, cannot, even though as much we may desire to do it, we cannot keep the whole law. We are sinful beings by nature. Right? Even if spiritually I got to the point, where I committed this flesh still lusteth after the things of the world. Right? That's a sin. So, God's commandments. I mean, there's a lot of them in there that we like to gloss over. I mean, we could just start with the first ten. That's why not bear false witness. Most of the time people abbreviate that to thou shalt not lie. That's a whole lot more than that. False witness. I started doing this a long time ago because I learned my lesson. But people come up, and if they ask me, they'll say, can you do me a favor? I do not say yes anymore. I say, I will try. Because a long time ago, I learned that if you say yes, people assume that you're going to fix the problem. Well, what if I can't fix the problem? You have not asked me or told me what the favor is that you're going to ask of me yet. So I'm going to say, I'll try until I figure out what it is. If I can't, I said I'd try, and I did my best, but I can't help you anymore. Right? We all, somewhere deep down in us, especially after we get saved, we want to help people. That's the desires that God put in us. We have a love, one for another in the church, but also we've got a love that the world doesn't understand on why we would want to go the extra mile for somebody else. But it dawned on me one day that what if somebody doesn't go to church, doesn't understand that I'm trying to do my best, but all they heard was, yeah, I promise I'll help you with whatever favor you need. But if I don't do it, that could reflect poorly on God. But it'd be very easy for me to sit there and under, you know, explain, well, I thought I could do it at the time. They don't care about that. All they care about is they heard one thing and I didn't do it. Well, you say, well, that's unfair. Well, is it? I said that I would do it. So now I say, I'll try to do it. And maybe a little bit of it was there. Hey, can you do a favor for it? Yeah, I can do anything. That's not true. Found that out the hard way. But, likewise. I mean, you can ask Doug and Sheila. They're driving on their way here right now. But you can ask them when they get here. It drives them nuts whenever they ask me a question and I give them a nine-minute answer. You know why I give a nine-minute answer? Because I want to make sure I got all the bases covered. Right? But here's what I think it is. Could be wrong, right? I just found out about this problem this morning, and I've read for like three hours on Google, so I don't know if this is completely right. But this is what I think the answer is. Well, how do we know that that's the answer? I don't know. I haven't gotten that far yet. You guys asked me before I finished reading. It drives them nuts. But why do I do that? Because I'm really trying my best not to bear false witness. But how often do we really consider, do we really say the words that we truly mean? Because here's the thing about talking. It goes hand in hand with listening. Communication is a skill that God's people could truly benefit from. In order to properly communicate, you first 
have to have an understanding or a grasp of what you're talking about. Okay, we don't have time to get there today. But you should know more about the Lord today than you did yesterday. Okay, if God's blessed you with a job, you should know more about how to do your job properly as unto Christ today than you did yesterday. Because God gave you that job to, one, work it for His honor and His glory, two, to bless you with a way of providing for yourself and your family, but then on top of that, to bring of the first fruits into the storehouse of God, but all of it is to be done as unto God Himself. Because He's the one that orchestrated the whole thing out in the first place. But, you've got to have an understanding, a capacity, so to speak, on what you're actually talking about. I know a whole bunch of people that talk about things that they have no business talking about. And all I want to do is stab my eardrums out while they're talking. Right? I don't watch the news anymore because I got tired of stuff like that. What do you say? Some people talk and they got nothing coming out. Right? They haven't learned that you got to know what you're talking about before you can start talking about it. But second, you also have to have an understanding of what is expected when you talk. That's why we listen. If somebody asks you a question, how often are we really listening? Or do we just pop off with one of the generic answers that we've come up with? Right, well, how was your weekend? I had a great weekend. We closed out revival. One person got saved. Oh, it was a good weekend. But hey, can you show me how to do this? I've showed you how to do this 19 times. Well, Jesus says that if a brother comes to you and asks you seven times in the day, 70 times seven, to forgive them. What, really what they're saying is, I'm sorry I didn't get it last time. Will you show me again? Because nobody likes asking for help. I guarantee you that. Especially if they know that they should know how to do it. But I think it was, you know, it was Brother Daniel. He said, what's wrong with just showing some people some grace? Right? Our words carry the sentiment that's down in here in our heart or as the Bible would call it the seed of emotion but I don't know how but God even though my tongue's here and my heart's here God's got them connected somehow because whatever I'm feeling down here or whatever I'm thinking up here has a real bad tendency of just coming out right well that person they've asked they're not expecting it right they're begging you hey I need some help. We can either ridicule them for it, or we can try and encourage those people. Right? We've already said, love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the standard that God gives. How often do we really live up to it? Right? And honestly, if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, right, we would have a heart that cares about us. Because you find everybody that came to Jesus with a question, he always answered them. And he didn't give them the watered-down version that would make them feel better. He didn't upbraid them just to make them feel low down and sorry about themselves. What did he give them? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But he did it out of love. Some people couldn't get the, past the fact that they were wrong, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, they never got to the love because they got upset that somebody was coming and teaching something different than them and that he was getting a bigger crowd than they did. Right? In fact, that's why James says, be not many masters, because they had many masters back then and they all were competing on who taught the best and who could get the biggest crowd and that decided who was most important. Well, God's only interested in one thing and that's what God said. So how often in my life do I embrace the fact that I'm supposed to talk like God wants me to talk? and not trespass against his commandments. Because if I don't love my neighbor as myself, if I do bear false witness, I'm not just, you know, not living up to the same. I've committed sin. Right? That, big deal. That's going to cut off God's blessings in my life. That's going to grieve the Holy Ghost in my life. That's going to put between me and God 
in imminent uh, space. We are no longer in fellowship. You want to kill your spirit, spirituality? Allow, you know, festering sin, unrepentant sin in your life. It's going to wreak havoc. But yet we don't slow down enough to even consider, well, Lord, what would you want me to say? How would you want me to say it? So first, if we can speak and bridle this tongue into where we don't trespass against God's commandment, it's one of the three general things that if we're truly perfect in our spirituality, complete, we'll be able to do that. The Apostle Paul wrote that he keeps under him the flesh. In other words, he bridled it. Not so that he could be perfect, but he said that he could be perfect, presented perfect in Christ. But Lord, I don't always know what the right thing to say is, but I do know that a word fitly spoken is worth golden apples and silver pictures. But I do know that if I say what you want me to say, how you want me to say it, that it can be very valuable not only to you, but also to that person. But I'm supposed to be an ambassador. Which leads us to our next point. We ought not offend the will of God in our speech. Not just His commandments, but His will for you. Right? If God gives you an opportunity, whether we realize it or not, we're always a written epistle, known and read of all men. But your entire life is an opportunity to testify the fact that in Christ, you are what you could not be before. That he has made you a new creature. Well, you guys know how I know that an ambulance is coming around? Because of the sound it makes. You know how I know most of the time if there's a police officer behind me? Doesn't happen a lot. But most of the time, I don't see the lights because I'm focused on what's in front of me. You know what I hear? Boop, boop. Oh, that's a police officer. Hopefully he wants me to get out of the way and he's not pulling me over. Right? But you want to know how the world knows whether you like them or you got something different? Because of the way we sound. Because of the way that we walk. Well, James said that if we can bridle the tongue, we can walk right. They said it's a slipper, slip, slipperiest sucker that we've got. I don't even know if that's a word. I know I can't say it, but... If we can rein in the tongue, we can rein it and rein in the body. So, and let's be honest, tongue full of po poison set on fire of hell. Right? It's also the most dangerous part of us. It's very rare that somebody will literally go out of their way to, especially hopefully Christians, Right, would go out of their way to physically do harm to somebody else. Most church splits, most people that fall out of church, right? most people that are offended, they have a reason to be offended because of what somebody said. We didn't say according to the will of God. Now, if we did say according to the will of God, then they still get upset. Right, that's between them and God. We're not talking about offending as in being, you know, abrasive to another person. No, we're talking about stumbling in the eyes of God. If I don't stumble but somebody else takes offense, that's nothing I can do about that. Let God be true and every man a liar. I can give credence to the fact that without the grace of God, I wouldn't know the difference. But when we speak, do we speak as God would will us to speak? Not just not breaking the law, but seasoned with love, seasoned with prayer. Knowing that God wants us to be the best ambassador that we can be, do we speak with our heart set on earthly affections or with heavenly affections? Right, it's His will that we should take up our cross and follow Him. But how often are we not focusing on what He wants us to do and our talk edifies things in the world 
desires of the world, things that tomorrow really don't matter, you know, aren't worth a plug nickel, especially if the Lord comes back. Or how often do people hear us when we speak that we've got something more lofty that we're shooting for you. And I'm not perfect, but one day I will be because I'm going to have a body like Him. Then I'm going to have a spirit that doesn't have to wrestle with this flesh. But that one day it will be. But he did promise that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That the arm of flesh will fail me, but he won't. So we know that we can through him. That, and it's, it's a very lofty goal to say that I don't want to offend in word. So many people think it's so hard that they don't even try. I don't know how many, but I dare say very few people walking on the face of the earth today that can say that when they go out, they don't offend God's commandments and they don't offend God's will with the way that they talk. And then, by consequence, if they can rein that in, they live a life that they walk upright before the Lord. But what... What a great thing that can be said about something. They'd stand before God, God would say, you walked and you talked like I said you should have. In the way that I wanted you to. But I know that that can't be said about me right now. Right? I know how many times I've stumbled. But the desire should be that everything that we say doesn't contradict the will of God. Right? And we could... Like Brother Daniel again, this past week said, you know, there's a whole lot of people. Testimony service get going on. Somebody's going to give up, give a testimony, and it's going to kill it every single time. You know why that happened? Because somebody spoke contrary to what the will of God was, and as a result, the Holy Ghost was quenched or grieved, and he cut the spigot off. What do you realize that if you speak in your daily life? contrary to the Spirit of God one, He's indwelling you if you're saved and as a result you're quenching not only the Holy Spirit and grieving Him you're grieving your own spirit because the Spirit lusteth after heavenly things it desires to be the perfect new creature that Christ intended us to be it wants to get back on the pottery wheel and let the potter mold the clay and put us back in the fire and make us into a vessel of honor for Him so when we speak contrary to it it being the will of God. Really what we're doing is we're sparking a war in ourselves. You've got the flesh wants to do one thing, spirit wanting to do the other. And as long as they're fighting, neither one's winning. All that's happening is, is you don't know which foot to step out with. And as a result, everything's going to fall apart. But by the grace of God... Right? We think that, oh, well, I, I messed up and I said something there. Well, one mess up quickly leads to more and more and more, especially if we leave it unaddressed. But if I go out and talk like the world all week, I'm grieving God in my life all week. Really, what I'm t doing is I'm tempting God and saying, God, I don't believe that your word, which says that you know, I ought to live as that new creature, I don't believe that you meant it. And we're tempting God to pour out judgment on our life. To correct us. Every time I don't say what God wanted me to say, exactly the way that God wanted me to say it, not so that I can get something from it, but so that His will can be manifested. But if I don't do that, I'm thumbing my nose up at God. That's not my opinion. That's according to your Bible. What we ought to say is, not my will, but thine, Lord. But when I say, my will and not thine, Lord, truly, I'm trampling the blood of Jesus under my feet. Thanks for saving me, but I know how I need to live. Right? But then, thirdly, we should strive not to stumble when it comes to our reputation with others. Honestly, nobody in here today would say, I 
want to become cast away before those that are around me. Right? The Apostle Paul said that in order to make sure he didn't become cast away, he strove to keep his flesh in check. He said, every day I still fight it, but every day I do my best to nail it to the cross that I should have died on and carry on in the Spirit to be born like Christ. Right? The Bible does refer to this as a way. In other words, a journey. I, I'm not going to get there overnight, but I can get closer today than I was yesterday. Maybe yesterday I didn't say all the right things. Well, it's been eating me up. And because it was eating me up, I repented of it, so today I'm going to strive not to do it again. But if we do, we do have a reputation in the eyes of other people. We are either stepping stones for them to get closer to Christ or stumbling blocks that they'll trip over and die and go to hell. But everyone that I meet is an opportunity for God to do something for them through me. Not because I'm anything special, but because... God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. Those that say, Lord, here's what I've got. Take it and use it for your honor and glory. God will give them opportunities to use those things for His honor and, their glory, and His glory. But I mean, yep, she's not in here. Oh, I'm not going to embarrass you. Sister Jackie testified to you there. Right? Somebody needed someone that they had faith and confidence that they could pray. Who did they call? Sister Jackie. Why? Because she has that reputation among them. Sister Kathy said it time and time again, people at her work, something comes up, they said, we need, some, we need people that know how to pray. Your church knows how to pray. That's not a reputation that was easily won overnight. But it is something that can be easily thrown away. Right? I ought not stumble... In my presence, really, this is what we all are. We're all a big movie screen that others can look up and see our life and what we project ought to be that new creature, something that looks like Christ. When people look, and I think of that drive-in movie theater up in Ohio, right? They've got the screen facing away from the road so that people just can't drive by and get a free show. Right? But our life, it's people driving by, but our screen's facing outward. And I've said it time and time again, I can't make myself look like Christ. Only He can do that. If I could do that, I wouldn't have had to been saved. So my job is not to make me into Christ. My job is I'm a mirror. i got to get all the filth and the grime and the dust off, all the things that inhibit you looking into that mirror and seeing the reflection. And then it's my job to point myself as close as I can directly at Christ so that when people look at me, they see Him. Right? That's the goal. But your tongue very quickly can shatter that mirror. Your tongue very quickly can tear that drive-in movie screen. And once a bridge is burned, it takes... Very, very often the only thing that's going to repair it is an act of God because what happens when somebody hurts you you don't want to be around them so why if I let this thing that's full of poison lash out at somebody do I expect them to still be friendly with me but if I do the will of God people may, may not like what I have to say all the time because the Word of God will confront you. But I have found that if you say it the right way, they'll thank you for being honest with them, and then they'll go away thinking about it. And often i found they come back with more questions. Or they come back with more opportunities for the Lord just to share something from the Word with them. But how can we expect to have a reputation in the community as somebody that truly is Christian? They were called Christians in Antioch because they had a life that looked like Christ, that sounded like Christ. You know how they started with that journey? 
They didn't get there one day, right? But that journey, they decided, I'm going to start with the tongue. My life may not look the way that God wants it to right now, but I can start sounding more like Him today than I did yesterday. And we don't have to get into... Sarcasm is my native language. Have you all met my father? I learned to speak sarcasm before I did English. And let's be honest, I learned to speak hillbilly before I learned to speak English too. Right? You can say something, exact same set of words, and you can have double meaning in them. You can say one set of words and be sincere, and the other way you can be flippant. You can say a set of words that say I care about you but you can say it in such a passive way because you're focused on something else that it's pretty clear that you don't care about them where does that all start with what well, we already got back to it. it's these things and it's with this thing our spirit because not only do I need to listen to what the other person's saying, I need to listen to God on how He wants me to answer them. And some things are no-brainers. Like, if one of y'all was to come to me, hey, is it illegal not to pay our taxes? Yes, it's illegal not to pay your taxes. You can go to jail for that. Ask Willie Nelson. Okay, y'all to pay your taxes. I can take and show you a chapter and verse. Right, obey those that have the rule over you and render under Caesar's what Caesar's render under God what's God's right. pay taxes right. there's some things that are no brainers there are other things that are complicated and take nuance to explain there's nothing wrong with hey I need to think about that for a minute right. come back in five minutes there's nothing wrong with running it through your head first better safe than sorry there's nothing wrong especially if you're in your spirit of prayer all the time pray without ceasing Lord how in the world am I supposed to tackle that one I'll give you a good example I was over at the work camp one night Brian, and a guy walked up to me wearing a rosary with crucifix on it and actually had Jesus on it I was, Rose me the wrong way, graven images. Something about them I don't like. Right? And there's something about them God don't like too, by the way. But guy walks up to me and he says, Hey, over in Revelation, who's uh who's that Babylon that he's talking about? Okay. Lord, how you want me to handle this one? Right? I need to tell this guy that the thing that he just asked me about is the church that he's put all of his faith in and give him sufficient proof from the word of God that he doesn't think it's just my opinion. I, I often tell the guys over there, if we ever get to go back, I'll tell them again. Right? If you got any questions, I'll stay as long as it takes for me to answer it or until they kick me out, one or the other. And when I come back, I'll finish answering it next time. And I'm sincere. That one, that was a long question to answer. Right? We had to take him to a few places. But afterwards, he just looked up and he said, Thank you. No problem. Happy to do it. But I can tell you the wrong way to have handled it would have been, it's a Catholic church and you're a part of it and you're filthy and wicked and against God. I don't know that. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Maybe boy didn't know any bit different. Found that in the commissary at the prison. All I know is, is that he asked me and in that moment I was responsible for not only what God said about it, but explaining it to them the way that God would have had me to. You want to know a real easy way to get somebody else never to ask me a question over at the work camp? Be mean and spiteful to that young man. But your reputation as a Christian outside of your actual relationship with God may be the most valuable thing that you have. How can you win the world if the world won't listen to you? How can you reach those that don't trust you enough to reach out back? How can you truly, through intercessory prayer, lift up somebody 
that you know deep down in your heart you don't care about. And every time you see them, you let them know that you're not fond of them. Not, not perfect. Talking about me. All right, but I have gotten better. All right, I don't say everything that crosses my brain. That's a good thing. Yeah. There's jokes. Jordan never shuts up. Well, up here, I need to shut up sometimes. I've learned that. Haven't gotten it down all the way yet. All right, it's real easy. You get heated. All right, real easy to get angry. Key is be angry and sin not. Right, be angry, but don't let your anger cause you to trip and stumble. Don't let it become an offense to you. The same comes with the tongue. We use it so much, and we take for granted how much damage it can do. But more importantly, we do not understand the potential that if we can tame it, the potential that that has for our spirituality. We'd all get closer to God if we just asked God, Lord, whip my tongue into shape. As a result, Lord, help me bridle this whole body. And then, Lord, let me walk, not close to the mark, let me walk as unto Christ, Make me a vessel of honor, not a vessel of dishonor. But a vessel of honor can quickly become dishonored. All it needs to do is start popping off about how great it is. Start popping off about how great this or that is and turn the focus away from God. The vessel of honor is called such because it brings honor and glory unto God, not to itself. Like I said, we could have done a whole series on all the ways that your tongue can trip you up. But the truth is, I really couldn't give you an exhaustive list because, like I said, it's attached to our heart. My heart's capable of exceedingly wicked things, so much so that I can't even know my own, let alone yours. But I do know that every day is an opportunity not to sound like me, but to sound like him. And if I sound like him, people are going to start asking me, well, why do you do this? Why do you do that? People are going to start coming up and asking questions, and when they realize my questions or the, my answers to the questions come from a place of love, they'll trust me enough to ask me another question next time. But I could throw it all away. And that fire, that little flame, can cause a great forest fire. In fact, I read a satirical article when the California forest fires were going on. That whole thing started because of the gender reveal party. They lit off fireworks to show what the baby was going to be, whether it was a boy or it was a girl. And the satirical article says, forest fires proof that God hates baby or gender reveal parties. But it all started with just a little firework. Might use to Smokey the Bear. All starts with a forest fire that somebody didn't pour water on enough. Might just go cook fire at a campsite. Right, well, your life can go up in flames. And it doesn't take much. Why? Because I'm just dirt. I don't even have enough common sense to realize that I'm just dirt. Right, we think that we're people, but all we are is something that God breathed life into. In fact, that's the great mystery from the beginning. Why God would choose to put himself, a great treasure, into earthen vessels. I haven't quite wrapped my head around that one yet. But I have wrapped around that because he put himself in me, he expects me to conform to the image of his son. And the Bible says, never a man spoke like Jesus spoke. It's real easy to give yourself away as not sounding like Jesus because Jesus only sounds one way. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.